Microfocus, creators of visual programming tools for software development, is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schaffe, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, we've done a lot of shows about computer hardware and software, but of course it takes people to design and build these things, and that's the subject of our program today, the people in the computer business, and I guess the Silicon Valley is in fact as famous for its young entrepreneurs as it is for its products. And speaking of young entrepreneurs, you're one of them having found a digital research about nine or ten years ago. Gary, how has the people side of this business changed during that period? Well, I know I've, I've traded in my cowboy boots and blue jeans for a three-piece suit here, so some, some changes have gone on. I think uh, the biggest change I've seen has been uh, in, uh, say, the, the impact of just having no products that are competitive at all to an, uh, a market now where everybody's in there, including IBM, that have multi-million dollar budgets, and you've got to figure out how to work around uh, big, big giants like that. Uh, it's become much more professional, and uh, the stakes are higher, and it's been a lot more fun, I think. Okay, we're going to meet some of the superstars of the computer field. We'll meet a man who's called the father of the Silicon Valley. We'll meet a man who revolutionized the computer business by coming out with the first low-cost portable. And we'll meet a woman who didn't know a computer from a commuter, but she's now the CEO of a major computer company. First, let's take a look at some of the other people who played a key role in the evolution of the computer business. Those of us involved with micros back in 1974-75 we had not already designed all of the interface cards and the peripherals and the software that goes into the mini computers of the day or the larger systems. And to us, it was so exciting because it was like we thought we were doing the things for the first time they'd ever been done. And it was all it was was it was the first time they'd ever been done that cheap using a lot of the LSI technology. And so there was a lot of just the excitement everywhere we went. It was like putting out a little table and showing off a little card that would play music on a computer or make color was uh, the most exciting thing in the world, and we thought we were way ahead of the rest of the world. What I was doing around that time was not even thinking about what, it, what are the right steps to take to have a very large, successful company or a large, successful product. It was just, I, I had been working my whole life to build a certain type of computer for myself, and I just built the best one that was doable in that day with the particular components available, etc. And um, in that sense, it wasn't sort of like, it wasn't like an intelligence. That, that can lead you towards the right path. It was just being very free. I, was, I had the freedom because I was only doing it for myself. It was not a company project where a manager defined what, you know, what had to be done. So I was lucky to be able to do what I did. Everywhere I go now, I go to, I go to business meetings and presentations and they're all sitting there in three-piece suits. It's a large business. There's a lot of dollars involved. The people who have come out of school trained to run and manage business is the key element today and that's where most of the creativity is going. There's very few technical technically creative products in the microcomputer world. Is a garage operation still feasible in the small computer industry today or is that stage over? Well that stage is pretty much becoming over for hardware. It used to be people could quickly manufacture some simple little PC boards on a small budget, get a, an ad in a little hobbyist magazine and start selling a bunch of them and so very small entrepreneurships, thousands of them sprung up, many of them centered around Apple. That was probably the, the biggest direction to go. Uh, now it's pretty much that's possible for software groups to come up with a good software project and there are avenues to find companies that will market it for you or turn it into a product if you've got something good going. It, you know, perhaps once a decade a very large market comes from zero up to billions of dollars within a few years. It's very rare that it, there's such a dramatic explosion out of nowhere of a new market. It may happen again in microelectronics and computers before too long. Maybe every 10 years, a new group of people come out, and they haven't been along with the Apple and the thousands of peripherals and the thousands of softwares, and they think every time they're doing it, they're doing it for the first time ever. They're going to get a, a couple of their own hobby computer magazines that are in their group. They don't come to our group. They're going to start talking and having little trade shows and showing each other projects, and they'll start new businesses of their own, and I think that's probably about to happen. It's like you go to a trade show, and they pull up in their mobile home, and it's a little garage shop. You know, they pull it out the back, and they show it off, and you want to buy a couple? And, uh, you know, these may be very large companies in a few years. But right now, we all shun them on them. We just say, oh, you know, there's just a couple of guys who drove out of their home with it. <laughs> That's what they said about us. Yes. I, I can, you can understand it. When you're looking down at someone else, you can understand how you were perceived back in those days. And then you also realize they were right. It's just a quirk of faith that, that they were wrong.
Though the computer industry is quite young and heavily dependent upon technology, it is the people who make it grow. Throughout this series, one can find some of the most influential individuals in the entire industry. Our very own Gary Kildall created the first standard operating system, CPM, or Control Program for Microprocessors, in 1974. In 1975, he started Digital Research, one of the top software development companies in the world. Al Shugart, a pioneer in magnetic storage devices, founded Shugart Incorporated, which he later sold before founding Seagate Technologies, also a disk drive manufacturer. Ed Feigenbaum is a professor at Stanford University and a noted author on the fifth generation, artificial intelligence, and expert systems. J. David Eisenberg is senior engineer of software development for Apple Computer. Dr. Kazuhiro Fushi is director of Japan's fifth generation project. Bill Budge is a game developer for Electronic Arts. Wanda Smith is Hewitt Packard's Human Factors Engineering Manager. David Nitsen is an expert in robotics. Professor Patrick Supis of Stanford University is a pioneer in the field of computer-aided instruction. Dr. Roger Summit founded Dialog, one of the original online databases. John Couch made a big contribution to the popularization of integrated software as head of Apple's Lisa project. Michael Arendt is a commercial artist who uses a computer as a design tool. Stanford University professor John McCarthy developed LISP as a fundamental language for artificial intelligence work. And of course, there are many more. It should be noted that the computer industry is made up of many different kinds of people performing many different functions. In our next segment, we'll meet some more fascinating people. So let's go back to our program. Joining us now is Adam Osborne, formerly of Osborne Computers and now CEO of Paperback Software, Inc., and Laurie Harp, CEO of Vector Graphic. Gary? You know, Adam, uh, you and Laurie have been in this business for a long time, as long as I have. And in fact, I remember you uh, when we were at Intel, we were working on some documentation together, and that must have been in 73. That's right. Yes. And uh, I know that a lot of viewers probably have some questions about, you know, is it possible really to get into this industry now, or has it been completely dominated by companies like IBM and Tandy and so forth? Is there a place uh, for, for a young inventor to really make, make his mark? Well, I think that all depends really in what area. If you want to build a microcomputer, it's probably not a good idea at this point because it's going to be the clash of the titans now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing high-tech about microcomputers anymore. It's very simply, you know, it's like building a washing machine or a refrigerator, quite honestly. It's the economics of volume and reliability, and that's it. That's the end of it. If, on the other hand, you want to go into some other area, good grief, you know, there's probably more opportunities today than there's ever been. It, it's just that you're better off uh, building razor blades rather than razors. If the opportunities are not in computers, where are these areas in which there are opportunities? Peripherals, add-ons, software, you, know, you can make a lot of money with extra cards that will fit into a popular computer, attachments, peripherals, particularly the software industry now, it's very much in its infancy right now. The organization and methodology uh, is going to undergo massive change, but on the other hand, there will be probably 10 to 100 times as much software sold every year, five or six years from now, as there is now. Obviously, that's hypergrowth. Obviously, that's whether there are, there are the opportunities. Adam, you talked about the titans, by the way. Who do you see as the titans right now? Well, IBM's obviously there. I'm quite certain that AT&T are going to come in to challenge them in a big way. And there will be one or more Japanese companies that come in as well, and they're going to dominate the market. Laura, you are in the business of making computers now. Uh, do you agree with, with Adam's perspective? Uh, yes, I would say, you know, what he said is pretty accurate. And uh, to just go back to your first question, is it possible for uh, companies to get started today? I think the costs involved are going to be prohibitive. When we started our company, you know, you could do it with $5,000, a lot of sleepless nights, and you would be rolling. Today, that's an impossibility. I mean, capitalization has to be several million dollars, and you still, I don't think, uh, have enough money to really get enough critical mass and short enough 
of a period of time to you know to be one of the contenders but uh, the peripheral market and I think especially in the area of communications um, is going to be extremely significant to uh, make add-on devices that link the kind of systems that have been installed to you know together when you talk about communications, you mean like communications with the source or CompuServe and hooking small computers up with the... Yes, uh, yeah. that's mm -hmm. part of it, right. The, I think the, another important point is that uh, large companies, the Titans, really only get into uh, an area of software or hardware when it's been proven to be successful. Uh, IBM is a good example of that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the small garage shop operations have opportunities mm -hmm. where uh, the large uh, company is just not willing to, to put the effort. Yes. And so there's, those are the spin-off areas that I think that will, that will be. There's also price consideration as well. When people are talking about investing thousands of dollars, they tend to be very careful about where they're buying because it's an investment. When they're buying a $50 product or even up to maybe sometimes a couple of hundred dollars, they say, what the heck? If, if it doesn't work, I've learned something. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of these very inexpensive computers sold as well as they did later just to collect dust. There never will be an IBM in software, uh, for example, because you're now dealing, eventually you'll be dealing with $50 products. And there's the vicariousness of human nature. Everyone's going to want to buy that little something different. So, uh, and in it's fact, only a $50 investment. That's where a lot of the know? real inventors are going to yeah. mm -hmm. show up would be in the software area. Right. It's, it's a comment that you just made about the number of co uh, small computers that are gathering dust. Do you have any just ideas of what you think the number of, or the percentage, say, of personal computers that let's say below the thousand dollar mark they're actually being used uh, productively you know in say a home or I would say probably fifty percent are catching dust mm -hmm. you know I have no way to totally substantiate that because I don't think a lot of research has been done on non-utilization of computers but I personally know several people who had gone out in the you know early days bought a radio shack bought you know the early available computers and are going out now they bring them home and they really suddenly realize they don't have quite the need they thought they had for a system. I would say probably 50%. I don't know if you agree with that, Adam, but... Uh, well, we've done a little bit of research in this area. It does tend to vary quite a lot by brand. The ZX80 and ZX81, probably more than any, are now collecting dust simply because they were bought initially by people who just wanted to find out what a computer was all about and they spent a hundred dollars doing it. Exactly. So that it, it, it served its purpose, so the fact it's collecting dust is no longer an indictment of the product. Mm -hmm. uh, the Commodore 64, we find, pr more than any is collecting dust, uh, and that's a lot of it to do with reliability problems where people just say, what you know, they're just not going to get it fixed mm -hmm. when it stops working. It only cost two hundred dollars in the first place. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of the inventiveness that's going to go into software is really going to be uh, around uh, products that really make personal computers are useful in the home mm -hmm. and take them out of the closet. Well, if they haven't been, uh, if they haven't been purchased yet, but actually make when they when they come into a home that they're actually used in in a, in a way that's uh, productive. Is that a concern of the industry, Adam? You suggested, well, it doesn't matter. Something like the the Sinclair. Well, it, it served its purpose. Or are people in the in this industry concerned about making sure that uh, I assume you want people to use these products, because then they'll go out and buy the peripherals and buy the software and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it depends really um, on each company and what direction the company is going into. We, for example, have no intention of going into the home computer market where, uh, you know, you go into this under $500 rat race. I mean, the economies of scales and manufacturing um, must, you know, is, companies such as our can never accomplish that. So, um, you know, from my vantage point, it's not an area I'm interested in. I mean, anything under $3,000 is, you know, an absolute no you know, for our company. We, we hear about the falling out that is starting to take place and will take place in the computer field, and Adam People's site, your company, is, is one of those examples. Is that, in fact, uh, something that has to happen and is going to happen? Well, Osborne Computer's failure was nothing to do with falling out. It was nothing to do with uh, industry uh, competition or collapse. The company, plain and simple, committed suicide. Um, all I will say about it right now is that everything you have read in the paper you can hit the reset button on because it's not right. This is not yet the right time for me to say what really happened, so I'm not going to. So you don't, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, no, but uh, very specifically, y your answer is partially yes and partially no. Uh, if 
IBM were not consuming 70% of the market, which they are right now, today. You know, the numbers that you read about are actually inaccurate. IBM dominates the market far more than any of the statistics you read. What I like to say, you know, I've said before, is that IBM is one, there is no second. You know, after mm -hmm. IBM, the, it picks up again at somewhere like fifth or sixth. <laughs> you know, if they weren't there, clearly a lot of other people would be able to do a lot better. But on the other hand, if you take 30% of the market, it is so huge that it will support an awful lot of people mm -hmm. who are selling three, four, five, ten thousand computers a month. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, sure, there'll be a shakeout, but then you know, th there's been a shakeout in the hardware industry. Gary, you remember a lot of the early companies. Where's I Insa? You know, where's yeah. where's <laughs> Mir? Yes, I mean, yeah. it, it's been going on for years. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you mentioned IBM, and of course IBM is a key player. We're going to soon meet a gentleman who played a key role at IBM and in the IBM competitors. That's coming up in just a moment. We are unfortunately limited to brief comments about a very few computer entrepreneurs who typify the vast contributions of their colleagues. But we can't leave this subject without one more example, that of the original Silicon Valley garage-based startup, Hewlett Packard. William Hewlett and David Packard both graduated from Stanford University in 1934. The two engineering classmates became close friends and formed their partnership in 1939. Their first plant was a small garage in Palo Alto and their initial capital investment around $500. Their first product was a resistance capacity audio oscillator based on a design developed by Hewlett while attending graduate school. Hewlett Packard has grown to be a major designer and manufacturer of computers and computer peripherals, test and measurement instruments, handheld calculators, electronic components, medical electronic equipment and instrumentation for chemical analysis. The company employs about 70,000 people worldwide with annual sales between four and five billion dollars. Packard and Hewlett have been extremely influential in the industry and both remain active in the company as chairman of the board and vice chairman respectively. We'll meet Gene Amdahl in our next segment, so let's get back to our program. Joining us now is Gene Amdahl, formerly of IBM, formerly of Amdahl Corporation, and now of Trilogy Systems, Inc. Welcome, Gene. Gene, Thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, very interesting to have your perspective on IBM and the IBM PC lookalikes that have come out here, because you've been, if there's anybody that's been uh, working with uh, following IBM and, and trying to uh, get at that customer's base, it's been Amdahl. Uh, and so, what is your feeling about the IBM PC clones or the lookalikes? Can they be successful? Well, I'm not as familiar with the PC area as I am with the hot, large computer area, but I am quite familiar with IBM, and their pattern really hasn't changed over all of the years that I've known them. And that is they move into a field when the field is just proven well enough in terms of uh, it becoming of a size sufficiently large to be of interest, and secondly, that somebody has learned what it takes to satisfy that market. Once this is learned, uh, IBM is then ready to move in for their share of the action. And if they are, have the same degree of success in this area as they had in the high performance area, their architecture will become a de facto standard, not because they will have the best architecture, but because so many people will be expecting them to be successful. Mm -hmm. And the cost of developing your applications on your, even your personal computer, are going to uh, be sufficiently great so that even as a person, an individual, you really won't like to change architectures in order to uh, progress through the mm -hmm. Uh, advancements. Now, how do you track a change that IBM might make in the future? Uh, if there's one company that I've seen that's, that's probably more secure than even Mattel, <laughs> or the U.S. government has been IBM. And how do you, how do you, what, when you stock up your large inventory, how do you 
uh, take care of that transition IBM might make, say, in, uh, in a moment's notice? Well, you can't do it perfectly, but if you are in a portion of the field where the technology or certain functional limitations have formed the boundary of where you could go, as those possibilities get moved forward, then, or as you expect them to be moved forward, you can expect that the uh, offerings by IBM are most likely going to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. okay, and so, so you, you sort of prepare of what's going on, right? Laurie, I know that you've been involved uh, very closely with the uh, whole industry as it's, as it's has switched toward IBM hardware. What are your feelings about the PC clone, PC clones? In my opinion, they are not going to have a future. Um, I think right now they're enjoying a tremendous wave because of the inability of IBM to deliver in su uh, sufficient quantities. And I think most of the clone companies, if you look at them carefully, are not creating any value. They are putting uh, hardware together, they're buying software that is available to everyone, and they're not really creating anything that makes them proprietary. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if IBM um, takes a different turn, a lot of the software generators will follow suit, and many of the clone companies uh, have to protect some of their installed base, and I don't think they can turn as quickly as IBM will, because IBM will have planned this move you know, a year or more in advance. So quite frankly, I don't think that, uh, you know, they're going to be a long-term solution. Adam, you described earlier the computer business now is like the dishwasher business, basically, and Gene said that IBM's power is really not that it has a better technology. Uh, is, is the computer business now not really as technology-driven, but marketing and advertising and packaging? Well, I think that uh, the major difference between the PC market as it is today and uh, the mar industry that Gene was talking about is the fact that it's really got nothing to do with high-tech anymore. For that reason, I would both agree and disagree with what Laurie said. I think the bulk of the clone companies existing today won't make it. The reason is that they look upon themselves as computer manufacturers. However, I believe that there is a vast market for clone companies. The reason is that uh, a rough kind of estimate that we've made is that there's something like 15% of the market where hell will freeze over before they'll buy IBM. There's 15% of another 15% of the market that don't care and 70% of the market who prefer IBM. Now 15% of the market is huge. Furthermore, there's another consideration. If you're talking about uh, people who are looking at it as though it's a dishwasher or a refrigerator, you're now talking about people who can come in to a huge install base. IBM is shipping 10,000 PCs a day right now. It doesn't really matter very much if they do go on to something else. The base they leave behind is so big that there are a lot of people who can run out their inventories. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, because they're building entirely on a low-cost, high-quality basis, you get somebody who comes in who knows how to manufacture and they can start eating into the IBM PC market more than they ever could a mainframe market because it's the same. For the very fact that it's the same, people eventually say, well, what have I got to lose? If a piece goes wrong, it's almost interchangeable. So the, people, the companies that would be successful are the ones that think of themselves as manufacturing companies rather than computer companies. That's right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Gene, uh, you've been in this for a long time, starting Amdahl some time ago, starting Trilogy recently. Let's talk, let's talk about the venture capital situation. How is it different now in trying to get a computer company going than it was a decade ago? Well, a decade ago, the, there was a great recession. There was also uh, a situation in which the capital gains taxes were uh, much higher than they are today some 50 percent. Uh, with the capital gains taxes like that and with the recession, the stock market for new issues was abysmal to say the least. It was essentially non-functional entirely. And how about today? Today uh, there's a, a rather buoyant market, extremely buoyant compared to 10 years ago. Lori, uh, what's your perspective on, on venture capital today? You just went through that, didn't you? Uh, well, I went through it twice, once in 79, when the venture capital pool was just uh, growing 
um, and you know I went through it again today. It depends on at what point in time you actually go out to look for money. In the history of Vector, having gone through the difficulties we have gone through, we did not have you know too much leverage to determine uh, you know determine price because we needed the cash so badly. But in many uh, startup situations where uh, you know you have something that has a very good angle, you are the ones who can really the, you're the the one who can essentially determine price because there are not that many good deals around, but there is a tremendous amount of uh, venture okay. capital available. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Thanks so much, all of you, for being here with us. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. This program has focused on some of the more successful industry entrepreneurs, those who had vision and an insight into the new technology and the perseverance to see their ideas through. For the most part, these individuals had strong technical backgrounds as engineers, programmers, scientists, and the like. And this was enough to get the business off the ground in its very early phase. Later, there came a second phase in the enterprise when a different kind of entrepreneurialism was needed to take the enterprise from a strong technical startup into the successful mature business. Once the ideas are formulated, the investment capital is secured, and the assembly lines are rolling, the product must be sold and serviced, and continuing return realized on the investment. That's when people with strong marketing and financial backgrounds are needed to make the company profitable. Good marketing people are trained not necessarily in high-tech or electronic fields, but in business and product marketing. As the computer industry matures, it becomes more and more like any other business, with all the various departments, design, manufacturing, marketing, sales, public relations, advertising, and the like. The only difference is the speed at which the computer technology changes, which continues to promote competition and entrepreneurialism by all participants in this dynamic field. Our next lesson covers computer security. Be sure and read chapter 23 of your text, and I'll see you then. I'm Herb Luckner. visual programming tools for software development is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution.